Hi, my name is Pablo Munoz Gomez. I'm a concept and character artist. I run the Zero Guides and the 3D Snippets website, and I teach online at the 3D Concept Artist Academy. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to create an image like this from scratch. So let's go ahead and get started. This tutorial and project overview will be divided in four parts. The first one, which is the sketching and concepting stage, will be done in Krita, the 3D blockout and sculpting in ZBrush, and the texturing and some other material setup using the Substance 3D tools. And for the fourth and final stage, we're going to be doing the rendering and compositing in Marmoset Toolbag 4 and Photoshop respectively. So for this project, I wanted to create some sort of small fantasy creature that lives in the forest, but with a more realistic approach to the texturing and the compositing side of things. Something that resembles kind of like those cool properties of macro photography uh, for insects, for example. I had a pretty clear idea of what I wanted to create, so there wasn't much of an iteration process for the sketch. I just did a very rough thumbnail in Krita, and at the end added a little bit of color just as a reference for the palette. There's no need to get into details at this point with the sketch because all I wanted was an indication of the number of assets that I needed and the potential placement in the scene. And this very rough color thumbnail shows that. Alright, so for the setup of these assets in 3D, I use ZBrush and I like to keep things very simple. The assets I need to create for this project are actually very basic geometrical shapes. So we'll start with the pebbles or stones from a simple sphere and I use the Gizmo 3D to scale it down on the Y axis and in the X axis as well. You could potentially leave it like that and then sculpt the rest, but I'll use the deformers in the Gizmo 3D to tweak the shape a little bit more. So from the gear icon in the Gizmo 3D, you can access a bunch of really useful deformers. I'll start with the taper deformer to scale the bottom and the white cone just allows you to change the profile of the tapering effect. Another handy deformer is the Deformer Soft, which creates a simple 3D grid around the mesh. It's like a lattice if you're familiar with that term in 3D. With the orange cones, you can set the amount of subdivisions or points that you can edit, and then you can use the masking tools in ZBrush holding control to mask or unmask points in the deformer and then just move them around to adjust the shape. As a piece of advice, the less points that you add to this lattice, the easier it will be to control it. Now, because this is the first pebble, and in case you want to flat that against the ground, you can use the flatten deformer just to get a clean, flat plane at the bottom of the stone. You can potentially do the same at the top just to place the other pebbles on a more flatter surface, and then you can use something like the smooth deformer to soften the transition of those flat planes into the rest of the mesh. That's it for the setup of this first rock. Pretty simple, right? Now, we're going to keep the surfaces very clean, and the easiest way of doing that is with a clean base mesh. So now that we have the primary shape, we can go into the C Remesher section under the Geometry sub palette and automatically retopologize the entire mesh. With the half switch enabled, Sirius will aim to reduce the points by half while maintaining the original shape. So we can keep pressing the C Remesher to bring down the polygon count. And now that we have one of the assets, we can go ahead and duplicate it from the subtool sub palette and tweak the shape slightly so that it's not exactly the same thing as the big pebble. You can also use the formers or even pulling and pushing the faces with the move brush, that would be good enough. And because we have a pretty clean topology, we can go ahead and enable the dynamics of division switch to see a real time preview of how the mesh would look like if we were to subdivide it. This is a pretty useful setting, and you can find that under the geometry sub palette in the dynamics of division section here. Now I'm going to repeat the same process for the tiny pebble that is holding the middle one in place. And one more time, again, the same thing for the smaller pebble where the character is actually sitting on. If you want to flatten some of the areas of the rock, you can use the clip curve brushes and you can access those clipping brushes by holding control and shift and then clicking on the brush thumbnail. And this brush will simply push the geometry towards the shaded line that you trace. Okay, now we have the main assets ready with a clean topology. So the next step is to apply the dynamics of division so we can actually have subdivision levels. And I'll repeat that for each one of the rocks. Then we can go ahead and focus on adding details to these rocks. There are heaps of ways of doing the same thing in ZBrush and adding details is no different. And it's actually a very simple process. Ultimately, what it comes down to is patience. So to speed up the process, I'm going to use some of my custom brushes that allow me to add high frequency details to the sculpt. And you can get a very similar effect by changing the alpha and the stroke type for your brushes. For example, you can take the standard brush, lower the C intensity so that it's not as strong, change the alpha to alpha 25 that comes with ZBrush and the stroke type to spray. That's it. After this first pass of detailing is ready, you can go with other sculpting brushes like the clay brush and add a bit more of like feature details and indentations. To add cracks and crevices, I like to use the damp standard brush that comes with ZBrush, but you could also use something like the standard brush with a high C intensity and a smaller brush size, and you can hold the Alt key to push in instead of pulling out the geometry. 
Now, the idea with these pebbles is to keep the surface relatively smooth. So a great smoothing brush to use in this process is the Smooth Picks. This brush is great because you will smooth out the surface while respecting a little bit of the crevices. I also like to polish and flatten some of the surfaces using the Trim Dynamic. And if you want, you can change the material so you can see the speculars a little bit better. Finally, to complete this asset, we're going to merge everything into a single subtool. Just make sure that all the pebbles have the exact same level of subdivision so that when you merge them together, it retains the subdivision levels. We're going to need some UVs for this mesh as well. So let's just go ahead and do that now. With the select lasso, you can click on an edge and it will automatically select the edge loop and isolate portions of the mesh based on the topology. The idea here is to basically isolate the bottom area of the pebbles and assign a different polygroup. Once you have done that, and once you hide the portion of the mesh, you can go ahead and use the Visibility subpalette to grow or shrink the selection. Then you can regroup Visible, leaving the hidden meshes with a different ID. That's it, we're going to repeat the same process for each rock and then go to the Zip Plugin palette. And from the UV Master, click on Work on Clone. This will create a separate tool where you can play around with the different settings without you know, worrying too much about affecting the real uh, working file. And let's go ahead and leave the polygroup switch enable and click on unwrap. That's it, we now have UVs and you can check by clicking on the flatten button. And to go back to the 3D mesh, you can click on unflatten, click on the copy UVs, select the working mesh file with all the subdivision and click on paste UVs to transfer the UVs from the clone. All right, so that's pretty much the summary of the tools and workflows that I'll be using to create the rest of the assets. So now we can move a little bit faster. So to create the leaf, one of the main elements that we can scatter around the scene, I'm going to start with a cylinder, masking brushes to protect certain areas of the mesh, and then the Gizmo 3D to scale and move things around. For this particular mesh, I will use the DynaMesh feature and the Inflate slider to make it a little bit thicker. You can find the DynaMesh feature under the Geometry Sub palette, and the Inflate slider is located under the Deformation palette. The rest is a combination of the Move brush and the Smooth brushes just to refine the shape of the leaf. I use the mask lasso to hide a portion of the leaf and delete the hidden geometry. You can find the delete hidden button under the modify topology section under the geometry sub palette. Now we end up with this very rough looking single sided mesh. So we can go ahead and polish the edges using the polish by group slider, which you can also find under the deformation palette. I just like to keep those tools in my custom UI because I use them quite a bit and it's just easier to access them like this. I'm going to use the Siri Measure tool that I use for the pebbles just to simplify the, uh, the polygon count of the leaf and keep the base mesh very clean. We can enable the dynamic subdivision, we talked about that before, and there's a handy slider in this section where you can add thickness to the mesh. Now we can keep tweaking the low res mesh, but we can actually see in real time how it would look if it was subdivided and with thickness. You can also turn on the post subdivide switch to get a smoother edges as well. And to continue the sculpting of this mesh, we can go ahead and apply the dynamic subdivision. So now we have a few subdivision levels and we just need to refine the mesh a bit more with the inflate brush and smooth things out using the smooth brush. Because this mesh is quite thin, sculpting details here might be a little bit complicated. So fortunately, ZBrush has a cool auto masking feature to work around this type of meshes. So from the brush palette, under the auto masking sub palette, you can turn on the back face mask. This is a switch that when you enable it, it will protect the polygons on the other side of the thin meshes like this. Now it's just more of the same, basically using the smooth brush to keep things clean as we sculpt details with the standard brush, or we can also use the damp standard brush if we want like uh, sharper crevices, for instance. And you can also use the inflate brush every now and again to add thickness to the edges, for example. At the end, I just duplicated the mesh and cut the stem, or I believe the proper term is petiole <laughs> or something like that. And I just cut that in half. The last step of this asset is to generate the UVs with the UV master, and we are pretty much ready to move on into the character. All right, so for the character, you'll see that the process is basically the same, just slight tweaks to the workflow. I brought in the assets with the pebbles so that I can see where to see the character. And for the blocking of this creature, I will keep things very simple. I use primitive geometry with the formers just to set up the primary shapes. Uh, again, more of the same thing that I've already mentioned. And probably the only new feature that I haven't mentioned is the stager feature. So for the horn of this character, I started with a cylinder in the center of the world and I enabled the home stage, which you can do from the stager section under the subtool palette. And then with the gizmo, I can move the horn around and place it wherever I want it to be and then select the target stage switch. That way I can switch back and forth between the home and the target stages to edit the mesh in the center of the world and then I can see the changes in the target stage too. Another interesting tool that I use for the ears is the extract function. 
You can use any masking brush to mask out an area of the mesh. In this case, I just use the head or the body of this creature. And then from the extract section under the subtool sub palette, you can go ahead and click on the extract button and then accept those changes. Once you accept, it will generate a new mesh based on the masked area. Just make sure that you set the thickness to zero so that it creates a single sided mesh. The rest is just a quick cleanup with the polish by groups that I mentioned before, Siri measure to simplify the geometry even more, and then dynamic subdivision with thickness, exactly the same thing that we use for the leaf. Now to edit the shape of the ears, I use the bend curve modifier that allows you to set points in the mesh and move those around. Now to create the ear on the other side, you can simply click on the mirror and well button, which you can find under the modified topology under the geometry sub palette. And this action will duplicate the mesh, mirror it and weld it together. So yeah, you end up with two ears in the same subtool. Now that we have the block out of the character, I just went ahead and organized things a little bit into folders just to keep the originals. And um, I merged the entire body into a single tool. And because each element of the character was blocked out separately, I have a nice set of polygroups. Now to start the sculpting and refining of the volumes for this creature, I use Dynamesh, but the difference in this case is that I will enable the group switch. So that way the Dynamesh process will keep all the parts separate. Now using the clay brush, I started refining the volumes and the transition of the arms into the body a little bit more before I selected these parts of the body and the tail to make a new polygroup and re-Dynamesh the whole thing again. So now we can use these smooth brushes to soften the transition even more because the arms, the body and the tail are dynamished together. So essentially they're part of the same mesh. When you have lots of geometry, which might be the case if you have a high resolution in the dynamesh, it might be easier to use the smooth strong brush that comes also with ZBrush and you can clean up the surface a lot faster. The sculpting process is actually pretty basic as the features of the character are quite simple as well. I forgot to add some toes or like nails or claws, so I just use another simple geometry with the formers to get the basic shape and then the serial measure to simplify it. Once I finish placing these additional assets in one side, I use the mirror and well feature that I mentioned earlier with the ears. And that's it. I did something similar with the mesh for the spine or the scales uh, that go on the back and the tail of the character. And to add more visual interest to the horn, I just switched to the home stage. And by the way, this is the only reason I set it up like this, because I wanted to show you the radial symmetry in action. So I enable radial symmetry on the Y axis, which you can do from the transform palette. And I set up the radial count to 16. Now with a C modeler brush, and if you want the shortcut for this brush is BZM, you can hold the Alt key and that allows you to tag polygons of the horn. I actually changed the radial count to eight and do that again. And with those stacked polygons, you can go ahead and click on them and drag to extrude them a little bit. This is the default setting of the Siri measure for a face action, but you can hover over any face, press the spacebar or right click, and it will bring up the Cmodel menu. For instance, we don't have to tag all the polygons now, and instead we can choose the polygroup all switch under the target, and that way Siri will target just the polygroups or the color ID that we clicked on. So now, for example, we can click and drag from the pink polygroup on the sides. And if we hold the shift key, we can actually move the polygons along their normals, essentially shortening that gap between the indentations of that horn. And another great thing about using radial symmetry is that it works with pretty much any other brush that we can think of. So we can keep using things like the move brush to move things around, the smooth brush to keep things clean, uh, maybe the inflate brush if you want to kind of like tighten some areas or some of the crevices. And at the end, I apply the dynamic subdivision just like we did with the rocks and refine the edges with the standard and the smooth brushes. And remember, because we have established the home and the target stage, we can switch and this mesh will be placed in the right area with all the edits that we did using radial symmetry. Now to combine the body with the legs of the character, remember we've been using dynamesh with groups enabled, we can go ahead and use another tool from the gizmo deformers the remesh by union, which will apply a Boolean operation and won't change the topology except where the different meshes are intersecting. In this case, the legs and the body. Now we can go ahead and simplify this mesh of the character with the serial measure. But first I'm gonna duplicate the body and I'm gonna run the serial measure process with the keep groups enabled on that duplicate. And this way Siri is gonna keep a clean loop around the legs and the body of the character as well. And you can keep doing the same thing, the same remeasure process over and over until you get something that you're happy with. After optimizing the low res mesh, I left the original sketch and the new low res model visible, added some subdivision levels to the low res, and projected all the sculpting work that we did on the sketch into the clean new topology. 
The project button is under the project section, which is under the subtool sub palette. The rest is just clean up the mesh with a smooth brush and any other sculpting brush that you might find useful. And to wrap up the setup of this character, I went through the process of basically <laughs> reorganizing things again in the subtools of palette section, and again just place all the final parts of the character into a folder. And from the folder gear icon, you can simply click on merge folder, and that will basically combine and merge all the pieces together while keeping all the original subtools intact in that folder. And remember, if you want to combine all of these pieces into one, make sure that all your subtools have the same subdivision level. That way you will be able to maintain the subdivision levels in the combined version. So that's it. We now have a single mesh for our character with all the subdivision levels. The last part of the process before we move into texturing is to pose the character a little bit. And I mean, we already kind of like set it up in a pose, but we can adjust a few things just to make it look a bit more natural. So I move to the lowest subdivision level so that it's easier to move polygons. And you can use selection brushes to isolate polygroups and then mask them to essentially protect the areas. And if you want, you can even create new polygroups to make the selection um, of certain parts a little bit easier. So for instance, with the arms, you can hide a portion of them and then use the grow or shrink buttons from the visibility sub palette to get the right amount of polygons and then create a new polygroup so that it is easier to select the arms later on and, you know, and move them around. The rest of this process is very repetitive, just more of the same, selecting portions of the model or masking areas, and then move and rotate them in place with the Gizmo 3D. And if you want, of course, you can adjust them further using the move brush. And last but not least, we can take advantage of the polygroups that we have to do a quick UV map for this creature using the UV master plugin in ZBrush. So again, another process that we've done for the pebbles as well as the leaves.